Thank you for the kind invitation to present on craniofacial surgery for neurofibromatosis. The indications that we encounter in neurofibromatosis patients are relating to three specific topics. It's either a bony defect of the skull fold, a bony defect of the orbit with intracranial connection, dysplasia of the orbit and or a psychomatic arch, or a combination of these three factors. The indication to perform craniofacial surgery can be either visual deterioration, a pulsatile eye, the progressive deformity of the orbit and or the psychomatic arch, and pain. This case illustrates orbital dystopia in a typical way that we encounter in patients with neurofibromatosis. As you can see that over the years, this child has developed a progressive ptosis of the upper eyelid due to the progression in neurofibromatosis in the upper eyelid. During that same period, he lost the ability to elevate the corner of his mouth and this resulted in drooling. Also, the orbit became displaced downward, also referred as orbital dystopia. On the CT scan, you can see that the orbit became expanded, and this was mainly due to defects in the orbital roof and in the lateral wall of the orbit and loss of the sphenoid wing. When the sphenoid wing becomes lost, you have the pulsatile movement of the brain being moved forward towards the eye and the eye becomes pulsatile. You can appreciate this in a clinical examination. The orbital dystopia occurred mainly because of the loss of the roof of the orbit with the intracranial content pushing downward on the orbit. At age 7, we decided to do a surgical correction of the craniofacial skeleton. This was done via a bicoronal approach and then taking down the frontal bone and the supraorbital rim to get access to the orbital area. Via this approach, we were able to repair the roof of the orbit the floor and the lateral wall defect using titanium mesh. It is essential to use metal in these cases because autologous bone grafts will, be, will get lost in time due to the same process of neurofibromatosis. On the right hand side, you can see the result one year after this surgery and five years later. You can also see that this type of deformity also has an impact on the dental and intraoral situation. And these children must be seen by a specialized dentist or orthodontics to take care of these malformations as well. A similar approach was undertaken in this child, who also developed progressive deformity of the orbit and especially a dystopia. On the CT scan, you can see the defect on the lateral skull, the enlargement of the orbit, and the loss of the sphenoid wing and orbital roof. Again, we corrected this by doing an osteotomy on the psychomatic arch to bring it upward and inward and we used a titanium plate to reconstruct the roof of the orbit and the sphenoid wing for as long as this is possible. The difficulty in these cases is that the vision is still intact and you don't want to put that at risk. So the further down you go with your titanium plate to close the defect of the sphenoid wing, the more risky the surgery becomes. So in these cases, you have to balance the risks and the benefits.
if it is just the sphenoid wing that is lost, anophthalmia can occur. This is what we see in this patient, where the upper part of the orbit is still intact and only the sphenoid wing was lost. This causes the eyeball to move backwards and it's illustrated as an anophthalmia. The patient asked for a correction, but we explained that this would be very risky surgery, putting his vision at risk. In these cases, we consider the deformity too mild to take all the risks involved in reconstructing the sphenoid wing. This child presented with a blind eye, which was very painful. For him, this was the indication to have an enucleation performed. In the same surgery, we did an osteotomy of the psychomatic arch, which was displaced to the lateral side and downwards. And we reconstructed the orbital floor to elevate the orbit and hopefully allow a eye prosthesis to be worn with time. In that same first stage, we did a debulking of the periorbital area, including the eyelid. Here you see the post-op result with a nice configuration of the orbit as illustrated on the X-ray. What is most disappointing is the result on the eyelid. It still remains too bulky and at present the child still doesn't allow to wear a orbital prosthesis. We performed a second stage of debulking the neurofibromatosis in his cheek. As this child still had a good function of his corner of his mouth for elevation, we preserved as much of the branches of the facial nerve as we could. During surgery, we use a stimulator to identify these still functioning nerve branches and to take out only the bulk of the neurofibromatosis. A similar but more complicated case was encountered in this girl. She also developed the lower position of the orbit with exophthalmia and we needed to treat this. The CT scan illustrated the bony defect, which was quite extensive of the sphenoid wing, the entire roof of the orbit and the temporal region. Initially, we treated this with peak implants, but with progressive loss of bone, these implants became detached. We had to do a second surgery to reconstruct the orbit. However, the MRI illustrated why this bone loss was so progressive, as she had a huge amount of CSF fluid in that area. We therefore decided to treat this with a VP shunt, which really limited the number, the amount of CSF in that area. We then did a second reconstruction, putting in new peak implants to reconstruct all the bony defects. If you take a look at the photo on the right hand side, you can see that the correction of the orbit in the horizontal plane is quite sufficient. But now she encounters a difficult balance between anophthalmia and exophthalmia due to the VP shunt. So it's a quite delicate balance between the amount of fluids that she takes in and the function of the VP shunt to really have a good position of the eye during most of the day. Whether or not a VP shunt should be always included in treatment of neurofibromatosis in these kind of cases remains a debate. So there is a lot of dilemmas that we have for performing these craniofacial extensive surgeries. We still don't know 
what the progression of the disease will be. And this is important to decide when timing of surgery should be done. You will leave scars that will never go away. The excision that you perform is not going to be radical and the recurrence is certain. And there is risks involved in this type of surgery. Severe blood loss, loss of nerve function and progressive skull defects that cause loosening of plates and implants that are inserted. Next to the craniofacial surgery, you will also need corrections of the soft tissue. The complaints that we encounter that make the indication for such surgery are obstruction of vision, drooling, exposure of mucosa that may cause bleeding, and obstruction of the external ear canal, pain or nerve functions that are already lost and require a disfigurement uh, correction. Specific for the eyelids, it's much more difficult to do a good correction when the patient is referred late. The involvement of the muscles of the orbicularis and the levator is much more complex and more difficult to restore with these late referrals. Also, getting a nice eyelid margin reconstructed is difficult. The lateral canthal area itself is often affected, but is a good option for surgery because the risk is limited and the correction can be fairly well. The temporal region is more risky. There is a risk of cutting the frontal branch of the facial nerve and this should be taken into account whether or not to perform this surgery. The nose seems to be more resilient for neurofibromatosis and often we see little distortion of the nasal shape and little progression over the years. So for the nose we generally are reluctant to do early corrections. Presentations on the cheek, chin and neck can be very variable. So we can have tiny neurofibromatomas in the facial skin, which can be easily excised, although they will leave a tiny scar, which are usually well. If it's more extensive, then we can encounter a sagging of the ear that might obstruct the ear canal. The cheek can sag as well as the neck. These extensive conditions are difficult to improve. If you excise the skin and try to pull it upward, it usually sags within a short period of time. Neurofibromatosis near the chin has the risk of cutting the mental nerve, which will result in numbness of the lower lip and chin. So treatment for these facial presentations of neurofibromatosis always needs an individual surgical plan. And it should be a balance between the negative and positive effects and the benefits should outweigh these. Always stress that surgery will not cure the disease. A recurrence will definitely occur, but we only cannot tell when this will take place.